What would you consider extreme? Extremophiles are species whose habitats are in conditions that most would call extreme, where phile means to like in Greek. There's no other word that accurately describes this in science, so I'll be saying terms like thermophile and acidophile today. See, to many of us and many other species, it might be too hot or too acidic, too much salt, or too much chemicals in the water. But to the extremophile, that's just another Tuesday. Now, what's the exact number you would use to label something as extreme or not? Eh, there's a rough number amongst the science community, but the point is that these species are spectacularly built to not just survive, but live and kind of need these conditions. Spoiler alert, in a lot of cases, extremophiles are just small bacteria or archaea bacteria, at least in our world. In my science-based creature collector that I'm working on, I really only have one more extremophile to show you. Up, up, up. Before you make a comment based on the silhouette, make sure you get to that part of the video where I talk about them, because I'll first go over a few types of other extremophiles through the help of some Pokemon. Through the new Pokemon Snap from 2021, we can see a lot of Pokemon in their natural habitat. But as we go into the Fireflow Volcano area, while this would already be called an extreme environment in our world, there's a whole bunch of Pokemon here. The point of labeling something as an extremophile is to say that only a few species really live here. If everyone's an extremophile, no one is. So when I talk about thermophiles, technically anyone in the Fireflow Volcano level should be considered one because they're living in an active volcano. No one should even be near that in our world, where our thermophiles are just certain archaea bacteria and bacteria, along with the fungal sword Darialis. But in the Pokemon's universe, even humans can stand an active volcano, so I'm not even going to count most of these bystanders, but I'll point out mods like Macargo's line or Heatran, who live in the lava, even in the latest Scarlet and Violet game. Chi Yu is told to swim in lava. Even thermophiles in our world don't live in lava, but there is some life around them, like under the sea. But we'll get to that later. Acids and bases differ from water by giving or taking away free protons, respectively, at least in the Bronst and Lowry definition. But yeah, basically, acidophiles and alkali files live in pH levels that most others cannot live in. In our world, we set the standard so far that only a few bacteria would fit in the category, and also another fungus, and an unclassified algae-like thing. It's not even called a plant. What the heck is- In Pokemon, I'd say that Muck and Swallet's line can be considered acidophiles. Is Muck an acid or a base? I don't know. It does get acid spray, but there's also no Pokemon move that talks about basic solutions. Side note. Wow, is base a poor word to use. I swear I'm not just calling them based all the time. Swallet on the other hand, I'm pretty sure they're acidic as they're based off a of stomach and stomach acid is acidic. Maybe I should do an acid versus base video in the future. I did make a design based off of it. Base, d dang. So remember how we talked about volcanoes? Now, what if that volcano was underwater? Hydrothermal vents are breaks in the seabed due to volcanic activity, but weirdly, despite being one of the harshest conditions on this planet, we get to see some life down there. Like animal life, not just bacteria and fungi. Even though they're not as hot as the conditions we described for the thermophiles before, mind you, a hydrothermal vent is not only pretty hot, but they also have a lot of hydrogen sulfide and other chemicals that most other species cannot live in. I mean, that that's the point of extremophiles. So, we haven't seen a hydrothermal vent environment in Pokemon, but in our world, we can bring up a few animals like the scaly foot gastropod, Pompeii worm, and the Riftia pachyptilla, the giant tube worm. How do these animals manage to live here? Of the ones I listed, they all have special glands that house bacteria, which are also extremophiles. 
Now, these bacteria don't photosynthesize, but instead chemosynthesize using the hydrogen sulfide and other chemicals that they could find to make their own energy. There's a symbiosis between the bacteria and the animal. In the case of the vent tube worm here, they protect the bacteria, and the bacteria provides the worm energy. Now there's another genus of worms that house chemosynthetic bacteria like the Lamellibrachia. Now these don't live in conditions as harsh as the hydrothermal vents, but they are the basis of the first stage of my design here, tuber. With these videos, I continue using Pokemon abilities, but yeah, they would have different effects and or different names whenever I make my game in the distant future. The poison heal here is to reference how their survival off of hydrogen sulfide is toxic to others, but they evolve into a proper giant tube worm, Fanta worm. Now you might be wondering why the spy motif? Well, well it doesn't have to do with Fanta worm being an extremophile. Here's the thing, every time I want to reference a cool animal or a creature, I want to tie them with another science lesson if possible. So it's not just like, ooh, look at this crazy animal. Though in this case, extremophiles themselves could work as just a science lesson. But Vanta Worm here is a reference to Vanta Black, which is known to be a coating that absorbs more than 99.9% .9 of light, making the thing that it covers look like a hole. Vanta is actually an acronym for vertically aligned nanotube arrays because they are actually super tiny carbon rods that are aligned to trap as much light as they can. Uses for this material in science include removing any stray lights for telescopes, cameras, and sensors. But yeah, surprise physics lesson over. When you look up extremophile on Google, Google shows you the tardigrade, also called the water bear. They've been a poster child for this concept, with scientists gushing over how they can resist heat hotter than the Pompeii worm. They can survive in polar regions beneath kilometers of ice, and they can even survive a trip from outer space. But this water bear is an imposter. You see, tardigrades aren't considered to be a true extremophile. Remember when I told you what file means? It means to like something. Water bears can survive all these deaths and trials, but that's not their natural habitat. They don't like it. They don't need those conditions to live. Because for tardigrades, their natural habitat is pond water. Excuse me, what? Why are they specked out so much in their defenses if they're just going to live in lukewarm water? How the heck does this survive the worst conditions when their home is the most mundane environment? So how does this Among Us imposter have the invulnerability of a Fall Guy bean? They dry themselves up, and they freeze up their metabolism waiting for the day to come out when it's safe again. Tardigrades are popular for a reason, as they give hope and some interesting insight about enduring harsh conditions, even if they aren't born to live in it. So here's the little astronaut shaped not to grade, with an ability which references their anhydrobiosis, which just means drying themselves up, and cryosleep. This might be too strong of a gimmick, so I might change it in the future. It all depends on going through some play tests, which I am very far from starting, as I'll have to be physically away for a good chunk of May. I, I don't want to promise anything, but it is still a big goal of mine to make a game out of this one day. There are a lot of other kinds of extremophiles, like the halophile. I could have mentioned Garkonocles line there. And there's psychrophiles, piezophiles, but we've already went through a lot today anyways. Comment with a Pokemon that you would call an extremophile, because honestly, a ton of fire, ice, and poison types would fit this description when we're comparing them to our world, but what about in their world? Who's extreme compared to other Pokemon? But at the end of the day, even if one isn't an extremophile, look at the tardigrade and realize that one could survive and get through so much more than what everyone expected. I mean, all these extremophiles and extremo-resistant creatures should tell you that life finds a way. So, thank you for watching my video. 
And thank you to my Patreon supporters. I have a whole playlist going over the designs I've made for my stem-based creature collector. My goal is to make a game because I've got a vision for the gameplay. Even if that fails, I'll gladly make more designs and content like this. But again, I'm going to try my darndest to make a very short demo by the end of the year. I just don't want to make promises and disappoint people. So thank you again for watching and I'll see you next time.